I would say based on um, what we just saw that it reaffirms our strong belief in Scott's innocence. What you saw from the prosecution when the prosecutor spoke, the only things, quote, evidence he gave out, about 75% of what he talked about, were simply Scott Peterson telling lies to Amber Fry, uh, which, quite frankly, no one has denied. And I have to, I don't think it takes any great legal brain to say that generally what you're going to find in any case of an affair is the man lying to the wife or vice versa. Um, so that shows again the paucity of evidence in this case that doesn't exist. The second thing that struck me was continues to say about the burglary things like that was shown at the last trial or discussed at the last trial. Very little was discussed at the last trial. That's absolutely incorrect. There were occasional things that were discussed that a burglary occurred but very few of the details were allowed in because they fought to keep them out. There's been a lot of new information since that time, but the key here is, and I would ask all of you in the media, ask them when the burglary occurred. They will not answer that question. When did the burglary occur? Because they know, they stated originally that it occurred on the 26th. They now know, we all know, it happened on the 24th. They refuse to answer that question. For those of you who saw an interview with Detective Bueller of the Modesto Police Department, when he was directly asked that question, his reply was, well, the question he was asked was, how could the burglary have occurred on the 26th with the media lining the streets? His response was, well, uh, 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 I, I think they broke in the back. Well, he knows very well from the police report that the burglars, in fact, said and they wrote up in the police report that they came out the front with a safe and they sat there in the front yard with a safe for quite a while waiting on a, a car to come help them take the safe. That is why they absolutely cannot answer the question. Ask them. Ask them for proof that it occurred on the 26th. And every time you do, I had another reporter said, that they asked him and he said, well, it was the most investigated burglary in the history of California. Really? Because if it was so investigated, why is it that one of the witnesses that they interviewed, who was part of a tip that was given to, I think, America's Most Wanted that said this gentleman was involved and they had overheard that he was involved, when they interviewed him in this great investigation, he stated, Oh, I couldn't have been there that date on the uh, December 26th because I was in jail. Nobody bothered to check the jail records. He hadn't been in jail for three weeks prior to that. That's the investigation we're talking about. They also don't bother to mention that a Department of Corrections official, this isn't somebody from the defense, a Department of Corrections official, Lieutenant Aponte, provided them with a tape. He claims, told all of us, that he gave them a tape of a conversation in which one of the prisoners was talking to his brother on the phone when Lacey Peterson came up and they basically made comments about knowing what happened to Lacey and let's shut up, be quiet, don't talk about it anymore. That tape was, according to Lieutenant Aponte, given to the Modesto police. They deny it. They say they never received it. But regardless, Lieutenant Aponte reported it turned it in and we have a declaration from Lieutenant Aponte about what was said and that in fact it was heard and was on tape and that he did in fact provide them the tape. All of these things indicate again the burglary is what we should be looking at but they refuse. They refuse to acknowledge it, they refuse to look at it and when you question them again ask them what evidence do they have it occurred December 26th. We want to know. If they've got that evidence, provide it to us. We're happy to look at it. Mr. Harris, you spoke on behalf of Scott Peterson. Yes. Uh, tell us how that happened. There was no allocution from the defendant. Allocution, yes. Allocution. yes. So what, what went down? Uh, Mr. Peterson was prepared to give a statement. The judge had issued an order as far as who was to speak. She did not mention in the order an allocution whether or not she would allow an allocution or not. Uh, she mentioned as far as the, the Rocha family, who would she allow to speak? Uh, so I questioned her and asked her if she would allow him 
to make an allocution, allow Scott to speak, and she said no. She would not. You would have to ask the judge about that. I, I don't know why she. There's there's case law in California about defendants talking during a sentencing hearing and what they can and can't say. Uh, depending on the specific case, there, there are just various things you can interpret it. Apparently what her interpretation was, or, or her decision, she has wide discretion as to what she can allow at a sentencing hearing, and her discretion was that she was uh, better not for him to speak. Were you surprised by that decision? I think what he would like to have said is he wanted to talk about the fact that he did one of the things that really upsets him is this concept that he did not want to have a child and he wanted to talk a little bit about that and the fact that he would never ever harm Lacey and Connor. I think he wanted to talk about the fact that they went to great lengths to have a child. Uh, I mentioned in the in the hearing uh, how he would come home during the best times of the day. I mentioned that they actually bought a house in Modesto uh, for the sole purpose of starting a family. Uh, there were Lamaze classes and friends they were doing things with. Uh, he had family members, despite what the prosecution says. There are a number of people who will testify how excited he was, including their partner at the Lamaze class, who he discussed at length how they were going to dress up their boys, uh, they were going to teach them how to hunt and fish and all kinds of things like that. There's a number of witnesses to that, and I think he wanted to talk about that. And I think he just also wanted to reach out and tell the Rocha family that he understands their feelings, and he understands why they believe that he is guilty, but he wanted to make it clear that there is no way he could have possibly harm Lacey and Connor. And I think that's the essence of what he was going to say. And how is your client doing now in jail? He's going to be here in San Mateo for until February? It sounds like it, yes. It sounds like he'll be here until the uh, until the hearing. So what's next? What, what's going to happen at that hearing? What are you the about? next hearing has to do with juror misconduct, the issue of juror misconduct. So what will happen is there will be witnesses, there'll be testimony as to whether the juror, the specific juror, committed misconduct and whether it was prejudicial. Um, I think she set aside about a week for the hearing, so there'll be a number of witnesses, a number of things that'll be introduced from both sides. If she finds that, in fact, misconduct was committed, and that, in fact, it rises to the level of prejudice, then there will be a new trial. She will grant a new trial. And that's what we're obviously hoping for. How does your client feel about these three sentences? I'm sorry, I can barely hear you. Well, any sentencing is hard, as you can see why, but Scott is focused on the hearing on the juror misconduct issue. That's the important hearing for us, because that could hopefully result in a, in a retrial. So that's what he's focusing on. I'm just going to add one thing. Uh, that is essentially what we ask. We know that a number of you have covered this trial for a long time. Some of you are new. Uh, we know that you're all in the situation with the media, the media is often criticized. We have tried very hard not to be critical because we know what a difficult job you have. But what we would ask is this. We repeatedly see, since the order for the retrial, we have repeatedly seen, once again, the demonization of Scott Peterson. Once it looked like the possibility of a retrial, we saw a number of district attorneys go stand out and have a press conference and accuse Scott Peterson of stealing uh, EDD money that he had falsified and was getting EDD money, they found out that wasn't true and of course there wasn't a press conference stating, well, sorry, we were wrong. We saw that. Then we see an instance where some murder happens down in San Luis Obispo and they start throwing out Scott Peterson's name when it was ridiculous, he had obviously wasn't even around it, but again, the media reports it. And when it becomes clear that in the preliminary hearing he had nothing to do with it, no one prints. Scott Peterson didn't have anything to do with the murder. Then, and this is the thing that I, I think I get very aggravated about, we made a point, as I stated in court, we made a point of stating that the Roaches should speak and be allowed to speak. 
And let me tell you how that happened. It happened because I went to Scott Peterson, I was talking to him on the phone, and I said, look, there's a lot of interesting law on who can speak at a sentencing hearing. If you would like me to, I can write a motion as to whether or not the Rocha family should be allowed to speak. Scott Peterson is the one who said to me, no, let them speak. They deserve to be heard. I know they're hurting. Let them speak. Yet the prosecution files a memo, sentencing memo with the court, straight out saying that Scott Peterson and his attorneys were trying to keep the Roaches from speaking. Directly opposite of what I had filed in my motion. It was a direct falsehood and they put it in there. I called them on it. I sent them the motion just in case they didn't see it. I asked them to please correct that and their answer was we choose not to do so. That tells you everything you need to know because again what gets printed is Scott Peterson didn't want the Roaches to speak at the hearing. The continued demonization of Scott Peterson. So all I'm asking of you is when you hear these things over and over and over stop and look at the past and what has happened and these continual things that he is accused of that have turned out to be absolutely false including number one being accused of the murder of his wife and child. With that, I'll let you go. Thank you. Thanks.